Right, um, good morning. So, I'm just going to make a start, but first I want to just lay out some ground rules because I feel like um, uh, the last stream on the Friday before Easter, um, the chat got a little bit chaotic where it was difficult for a lot of back and forth and talking through that's relevant to the actual content. Um, so, I'm just trying to make it clear to everybody to not use the chat for like you know, just silly reasons, chatting or whatever, um, you can use other social medias for that. Okay, so I'm just going to give you guys a link now to the resources um, that I would want you to use. Remember, it's all on the website. And another goal of mine for today um, is on Show My Homework, there is a quiz. Some of you guys have already done it, but consider it as sort of like the topic test that we're going to be having for unicellular organisms. So there are multiple attempts that are available on it. So if you like go there, you attempt it once, you didn't really get a good score and you feel like you need to attempt that quiz again, hopefully after today you'll feel a bit more confident with making another attempt on it and getting a good score. Okay, so if you follow that link, remember at the bottom I do have a place where you can take notes for those of you who want to take notes. You don't have to. Remember all of this is optional. The main requirement is the mini projects that Mr. Durston has set and the topic tests. So those two are like the mandatory things. This is just to help support you to feel a bit more confident because I do recognize that going off and learning things on your own, that can be quite challenging. So if you want to take notes, feel free. Um, I recommend clicking on the docx one and downloading that because that way you can type things in as we go along. So last we left off is we um, talked about what a microorganism is, um, examples, we talked about fungus in particular, microscopic fungus. and now I want to move on because we need to talk about the other two, bacteria and protoctus. So bacteria, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, you guys would already ha know a bit of background about what bacteria is because um, bacteria is a very common thing that shows up in our everyday lives. We're always discussing bacteria. Um, we often call bacteria things like germs and whatnot. We often take antibiotics because harmful bacteria often enter our bodies and cause damage and cause infections. But there are many, many, many different types of bacteria, not all of them bad. When we talk about bacteria, the our automatic response is thinking that all bacteria are bad, but a lot of bacteria are actually really helpful. For example, in our digestive system, in our gut, we have a lot of good bacteria that help us digest food. So because there's a lot of bad bacteria, good bacteria, bacteria that don't really affect humans at all, it is important for scientists to be able to identify what a bacteria is. You don't need to memorize all of the different types of bacteria, right? That's, that's completely impossible. But the main skill I want you guys to be able to, to do is to be able to use a key. So say for example, on an exam or in the future as well, because this is a very useful skill, even if it's not, you know, something in key stage three, this will show up later. If I had a key like this, this was given to you, what's on the right hand side, it's given to you. If I had a key like this, along with a picture of a bacteria, I want you guys to be able to identify the type of bacteria it is by looking at the key and following it along. It kind of works like a flowchart, even though it's like a, in list form. So, 
We'll start off with number one, shape like a straight rod or not shape like a straight rod. Well, like it kind of might look like a straight rod, but it's not particularly straight. It's a little bit curved, isn't it? So if it's not shaped like a straight rod, I'm going to go to number five. So I'm going to go here. Now I'm going to look at the key. Is it round shape or comma shaped? Looking at the uh, the picture now, it's not really particularly round, right? It's kind of long and thin, and I would say it is comma shaped. So, this particular bacteria, oops. I'm not even going to pretend that I can pronounce that. Vibrio cholera. I know it's. I know it is cholera. It, it, it is actually a harmful bacteria. Vibrio cholerae. You can have a go yourself. So, the whole purpose of that is just for you guys to understand that um, there's many different types of bacteria. And we can identify what a particular type of bacteria something is by what it looks like and following a ready-made flowchart, following a ready-made key, just by using logic, just by observing what it looks like. Now we're going to talk about how bacteria reproduce. If you remember from way back before Easter break, we talked about uh, fungus um, and how they reproduce, particularly yeast. And remember, yeast produce by budding, where smaller bits of the actual main yeast sort of bud off, where if I were to draw it like this, say this was a regular yeast, a little bit of that yeast grows from it and sort of leaves and becomes a new yeast cell. So it sort of like pops off of the original yeast. Bacteria reproduce a little bit differently to, um, to yeast cells, to fungus. They also reproduce asexually, meaning they don't need a partner to reproduce. But instead of having a small little bit bud off of it, they just split in half. We call that binary fission. Binary, bi, typically means two and fission means splitting. So you can think of this key phrase binary fission as splitting into two. If we have a look at this diagram here, this is just to outline what binary fission looks like. So instead of having like a little bit split off here like in yeast, instead what happens is it starts splitting in half right down the middle until we have two separate bacteria. So fungus is budding. Bacteria is binary fission. And then now we have two identical bacteria cells as a result just from being split right down the middle. And the requirements that bacteria need to grow is pretty much the exact same as what we talked about when it comes to fungus, right? They obviously need nutrients, so they need something to be coming in, whether it be sugars, protein, or anything like that. They, bacteria also need to eat as well, or they will die. Um, they need some sort of warmth because their enzymes need to work. As is the case with pretty much all living organisms, if things are super, super cold, our bodily functions start shutting down because we don't have enough energy, we don't have enough warmth for our enzymes um, in our bodies to be able to do the jobs that they need to do. 
And we also need moisture, because water is the basis of all life. We need some sort of moisture to allow for chemical reactions to happen, for to allow for things to move around. So it is quite basic what bacteria need to grow. There's there's nothing unique about it. Nutrients, warmth, moisture. That's the ca that's the case for all living things really, and it was the case for back um, for fungus as well. So bacteria, very similar to fungus, they look entirely different, they reproduce differently, even though both in both cases they don't actually need a partner to do it, but we call that process different. With fungus it's called budding, with bacteria it's called binary fission, but as is the case with all living creatures, they need nutrients, war warmth, and moisture, water. So. Previous, when we talked about yeast, we talked about the different types of um, respiration and we also talked about what they can make. So remember when it came to uh, yeast, when we don't allow oxygen, we end up with what's known as anaerobic respiration. And with yeast, if we remember what type of um, what type of foods anaerobic respiration can produce. When we don't have oxygen, we can produce alcohol, remember, with yeast. And when we do have oxygen, we can produce bread with yeast. With bacteria, it can be a little bit different of what we produce. We don't do, um, it's, it's not exactly the same as is the case with uh, yeast. We don't produce the exact same foods. Some of you guys may have done some studying on your own about what bacteria can produce. So I just want you to have a little think now. With anaerobic respiration, when we don't have oxygen involved in bacteria, think back to what you guys did in Seneca and see if you remember what type of foods we can produce. Um, that that is a good. That's a very good question, Lucy. Um, vegetarians like it's not that they don't eat any living things because like vegetables, plants are living creatures as well. Um, so I don't think that vegetarians like refuse to eat bread because yeast is not an animal. I think vegetarians mainly don't want to to eat animals specifically um, because like plants are living as well. Okay, let me write this out. So it's it probably would make it a lot easier for you guys if I sort of separate fungus. Let me actually pull up a separate document to write it out on a blank page. Okay. So previously we talked about fungus, Actually, let me say yeast specifically. Now if we have oxygen, and we have aerobic respiration. Remember that when it comes to aerobic respiration, we produce Oh, come on. We produce carbon dioxide.
and the carbon dioxide that gets produced is basically what causes bread to rise. This is a recap from, um, from when we talked about yeast. But if we have no oxygen, so anaerobic respiration, we don't actually produce carbon dioxide because if you think about carbon dioxide, to make carbon dioxide, you need oxygen because carbon dioxide is CO2. So if you don't have oxygen, in the case of no oxygen available, we can't make the O2 and CO2. Instead, what we make with yeast is we make alcohol. So um, when it comes to like beer, that gets made from yeast. I'm going to draw it. This is my beer mug. Bacteria, we don't really use um, bacteria in the case of uh, aerobic respiration. We don't really use it to, for foods, but we do use anaerobic respiration. We do use bacteria um, in the case of no oxygen. And just to give you a hint as to what we make, the bacteria turns the sugars into something that is sour. So we often use um, bacteria to make our yogurts and also our cheese. So when you are eating yogurt and you have that sour taste, that comes from the lactic acid that's produced by the bacteria itself. And obviously you can eat that bacteria, that bacteria is not going to be harmful to you because remember we talked about how um, there are many different types of bacteria, not all of them are bad, many of them are good, many of them are you know just neutral in our bodies, they don't, they don't do any harm. So we often use microorganisms to help with producing, with making our food. In the case of yeast or fungus, if we give that yeast oxygen, we can produce carbon dioxide, which helps make fluffy bread, because that gas, when that gas gets made, it puffs up the bread. If we don't allow oxygen, say we put things in a barrel, cut off the oxygen supply, the yeast instead, instead of producing carbon dioxide makes alcohol, aka ethanol. With bacteria, we don't really use aerobic respiration um, for bacteria, but when we cut off the oxygen supply to bacteria, they start producing acid, which we use then for our yogurts and our cheese. Okay, so One thing that I want you to t think about when it comes to remembering this is to think about how yogurts are actually a little bit sour. So that comes from lactic acid from the bacteria. And you guys obviously, um, hopefully, know nothing about beer. But in 10 years time, when you are allowed to have a little bit of beer, not too much. In the far, far future, I want you to think about this lesson. 
and I want you to think about how it does taste a little bit like uh, beer does taste a little bit yeasty because you use yeast to make the alcohol in brewing. So anaerobic respiration means no oxygen. Okay, now we're going to talk about protoctus, and this would be probably brand new to a lot of you, right? So fungus, you guys probably already had a little bit of background knowledge about fungus and yeast. Bacteria, you probably had a little bit of background knowledge about bacteria, or at least you would have heard of it before. But protoctus probably is a brand new word. It's prob The reason why that is, is because we don't really come across protoctus often. They don't really, um, they're more specifically in bodies of water like ponds or lakes or oceans. We don't really deal with them on a regular basis as much for us to be concerned about them in any way. So there are three main types of protoctus that I want you guys to be aware of. First we have paramecium the plural, if I were to talk about more than one, it would be paramecia. Then we have amoebas. You may have heard of amoebas before. And then we have algae. And you may have heard of algae before. They look entirely different if you have a look at these pictures. And that's because um, the way they move is different. They w The way they get nutrients is different but they're all part of the protoctus umbrella. So they're all part of the protoctus kingdom, but they're a little bit different in different ways. And I do believe on your quiz, there is a, a question about amoebas and how they move. So this would help you answer that question. So first I would want to talk about paramecium. If you have a look at uh, this, You'll notice that there's like little, looks like little hairs on the outside of my paramecium. And those little hairs are called cilia. Cilia sort of act like little brushes to help the paramecium move around. So remember that we're talking about bodies of water here. So if you imagine this in like a pond to help it swim, these little hairs sort of move back and forth, like brush back and forth to help it move around. And I've pulled up like a, a GIF or a GIF for you guys. So hopefully we can see this clearly. So on the outside, it might be a little bit hard to tell. This is obviously under a microscope, but there are tiny little hair-like um, protrusions on the outside of the paramecium. Those little hairs are called cilia. They're not like real hair. They just look like hairs. And it helps them move around as they sort of sweep back and forth. It helps them move around in this body of water. So that's what cilia are. Cilia. So cilia have sort of these like hair-like features that sweep back and forth um, to help it move. Remember, because it's in a body of water, it's not, you know, on land because it'd be really difficult for it to move on land like that. So it's in water, it just pushes the water around itself and allows it to move. With amoeba, the way they they move is using what are known as pseudopods. Pseudopods translates into fake feet. Pseudo means fake. Pods, feet. So basically, 
what it does it is it like sort of sticks out um, a little bit of itself oops it sticks out say this foot this pseudopod and then this bit would grow into another pseudopod and it sort of move along that way I'm gonna find a video of an amoeba moving to help you guys imagine what is going on here Okay, there we go. So this is a lot better video for you guys to have a look at. So each little bit out here is a pseudopod. So there's a pseudopod by here, there's a pseudopod by here, and it sort of reaches out with the pseudopod, pulls its body along, and then reaches out again with more pseudopods and repeats kind of like it's sort of walking along that's why we call it fake feet because it's they're not anything like real feet but they act like they are and then with algae they have flagella we would have talked about flagella before um, when you guys were in year seven and learned about sperm cells similar thing instead of having like tiny little hairs like cilia is um, it would just have one long kind of like a tail that sweeps back and forth to help it move Okay, so those are the three different ways that um, the three different protoctus move. We have paramecium that use cilia, amoeba that uses fake feet or pseudopods, and algae that uses flagella to help get itself around. Paramecia, it's quite interesting with paramecia how they eat because they sort of have um, like a little tiny little hole I put mouth in quotations because it's not actually a mouth it's n not as complex as our mouths are but it's this tiny little hole and what it does is the cilia sweep sweeps food into hole which is the mouth so the cilia basically as it's moving around it's also sweeping nutrients into the hole to allow it to eat. With amoebas they can actually um, as they move because as we saw in the video they can sort of like change their body shape really really easily they basically surround their whole body and entirely engulf the thing that they're trying to eat. So I have here by here is um, in the middle is food is some nutrients for the flagella to eat and the flag uh, not the flagella sorry the amoeba and basically um, the amoeba changes its entire body shape to s completely surround it and eat it that way so it almost like absorbs and takes in what it's trying to digest so this whole dark bit by here is an amoeba you'll notice that it's a very strange shape because it's changed its body shape to kind of trap this organism here and it can't get out and then eventually the amoeba just absorbs entirely and digests it down and amoebas are 
sort of very common in ponds, lakes, um, any sort of body of water for us to to be aware of because sometimes amoebas can be harmful to us as well. If you guys have heard about brain-eating amoebas before, let me look that up actually because it's a There we go. Where are they? Hopefully not in Britain. I think they're also in New, Zeal New Zealand or Australia someplace. Yeah, mainly Australia. So there are a special type of amoebas um, called brain-eating amoebas that if we like go for a swim in a pond mainly only in Australia I suppose but if we dunk our heads underwater the amoeba go up our noses and can actually start eating away at bits of our brain so amoebas are nothing to mess with nothing to trifle with they can actually do a lot of harm um, now on to algae Instead of eating another organism, like amoebas and paramecias do, so amoeba, let me just write down, surrounds organism. They can actually perform photosynthesis. So they have chloroplasts, To make their own food. So algae don't need to eat anything else in order to get its nutrients. And all of these, all of the different protoctus, they have these small storage organelles. So they have um, like little vacuoles, we call them, inside the cell. And they basically just act as storage for when they take in nutrients or when, in the case of algae, when they make their own nutrients they have a place to store all of the nutrients. So stores food. So with paramecium, after the cilia sweeps the food into its mouth, it ends up in a storage vacuole ready um, to be released as energy for when the paramecium needs it. In the case of an amoeba, it surrounds the um, thing it's trying to eat, takes it into the body, and then has it in a storage vacuole, the nutrients in the storage vacuole for when it's ready to release that for energy. With the algae, it makes its own food, but any extra food that it makes gets stored in the storage vacuole. So all of them have these storage vacuoles. Now, last bit before I let you guys go and have another attempt at the quiz. A lot of these you may have heard of before back in primary or in year seven, but there's just a few um, things that you, we have to understand about how our environment works, how our ecosystem works. So all of these different forms of life that we learn about, um, they form like a lovely little tapestry where we're all sort of connected and dependent on each other. That sounds really sort of cheesy, but it is true. We're, Humans can't survive just on its own as we are the only organisms or anything like that. We need and depend on other things. And one of the aspects that allows us to understand what depends on what is by using what are called food chains to analyze where our nutrients come from. So at the very bottom, any sort of environment, any ecosystem, where organisms are living together need something to make the food. These are known as producers and producers are plants, algae, anything that doesn't need to eat something else for food, it can make its own food using sunlight to power that process. So producers produce own food. 
examples, plants, algae, anything that can do photosynthesis. Now we are consumers. We can't just go out, have a sunbathe, and start making food for ourselves. We need to take in something else. We need to eat nutrients in order to survive. So we get our nutrients from eating other organisms. Examples include us, but based off of what we just talked about, they also include the paramecium and amoeba as well. So as consumers, even though we're at the top of the food chain, we need to depend on the producers in order to survive. And in a lot of cases, um, consumers depend on other consumers in order to survive and move up the food chain. So there are types of consumers. We can have herbivores, which you can think of as being vegetarian or vegan, so they only eat plants. Now some animals don't actually eat other animals at all. Um, you can probably think of many, many different examples. Um, I'll come up with one. For example, you're not going to see a little bunny rabbit all of a sudden eat another living thing, eat a mouse or anything like that to get its nutrients. It, it's not programmed like that. It doesn't want to eat um, another another animal. It only wants to eat plants or it only wants to eat plants. Um, carnivore is the exact opposite. Only eats so example would be a lion um, and then omnivore is like us where we can eat both. So those are the main three types of consumers where either only eating plants, only eating other animals, or eating both. Now we mentioned food chains. Food chains are actually just sort of how we represent what something eats. Um, in a diagram form. So we show the flow of nutrients. We start off with algae as an example. <clears throat> algae are producers. They can produce their own food. And what eats algae is we can have mussels that eat algae. And then the octopus eats the mussels. And then the shark eats the octopus. So basically, a food chain just shows that sort of flow of nutrients all the way from algae to the very top of the food chain to that shark. And the arrows are showing the flow of nutrients slash energy. Because when the shark eats the octopus, the energy that he gets from that, the nutrients that he gets from the octopus, those nutrients didn't just come from nowhere. That octopus got those nutrients from the mussels, and the mussels got those nutrients from the algae, and the algae got those nutrients from photosynthesis. So you're always going to have a producer at the very base, at the very bottom of that food chain because they're the only ones that can actually create the nutrients from scratch. They're the only ones that can actually make it and they, f and they bring it up the food chain as one thing eats another thing eats another thing. So a food chain is basically just to show via a diagram the flow to show the flow
flow of nutrients or energy. And the arrows just basically, you know, show what eats what. So this arrow by here is not showing that the shark is eating the algae. It's showing that it's eating the octopus. So it's sort of like a straightforward diagram just to show what is eating what. A bit more complicated, but still a diagram, is we have what's known as a pyramid of numbers. And this is just to show the populations. At the bottom of the pyramid is always the producer at the bottom. And then we have the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So if you notice, it's the exact same at the food chain, just vertical instead of horizontal. But the reason why we have um, it in blocks like this is to, just to show the numbers. So for example, um, in terms of population, we have more algae than we do number of sharks. We have more mussels than we do number of octopuses. So in terms of population, the one that is the smallest block is going to be the lowest population. The one that's the largest block is going to be the biggest population. But it's not always going to be this shape. Because for example, let's say that we had one tree. Well, it would go at the bottom because it is the producer. But let's say on that tree we had um, 10 caterpillars. Well, that next block would be a bit bigger. And then eating the caterpillar are a few birds. So the shape of this pyramid wouldn't look very much like a pyramid, but I'm just using this as an example to show you that it's not always going to have this perfect triangular-like pyramid shape. It could be a little bit lopsided depending on the population, like in my example where at the very bottom is like an oak tree that sustains many, many organisms. So the size of the block is the population, but where it is, wh which layer it is, is dependent on what level it is in the food chain. And the p good thing about the pyramid by numbers, the reason why we use something like this is just to show how poisons or toxins can actually make its way up the food chain and end up being harmful. So let's say that we start off with algae. Each of my little red dots here represents poison or a toxin. Well, in the algae itself, it's quite spread out. Damselfish that eat the algae, it's a little bit more concentrated, but still at safe levels. Barracuda eats the damselfish, a bit more concentrated. <clears throat> and then if a human then eats a barracuda, that poison then would be a lot more concentrated, a lot more concentrated to the point where we would feel sick after eating it. So when it comes to a lot of poisons and toxins, we do have to be mindful about how those would pass up the food chain as well. It's just how nutrients pass up the food chain. Anything that is harmful can also pass on in the food chain. So poisons that are persistent, meaning they don't break down, can be more concentrated as it goes up and up and up. So for example, let's say that we ate damselfish instead. Well, we still might be a little bit okay. It might not be fully concentrated at that point. So it depends on where we're eating it from in the food chain itself because as it passes up, it gets more and more concentrated because the number of red dots has not increased, but because it's passing up, through a smaller and smaller population, the spread is going to be less. So we talked about producers, we talked about consumers, 
Now I'm going to mention what decomposers are, and this is the entire cycle of life. So decomposers break down dead or decaying organic matter. What that means is anything that like used to be alive or contains living materials, um, organics is things like for example, feces, like our poop, could also be considered organic matter. So decomposers would help break that down. And there are many, many examples of decomposers. Um, we can have, say, microorganisms, bacteria, we can have fungi, we can have protoctus, so all the ones that we talked about can be um, decomposers. We can also have other types of decomposers such as um, like bugs and things can be decomposers as well. So what ends up happening is basically these yellow structures here they're long molecules, they're large molecules, so they're large molecules. And they're very big, so they can't be directly absorbed into our decomposer. So let's say here is a bacteria that is about to decompose these large molecules. What the bacteria does to try to break it down because it can't absorb it directly is it releases these blue bits here and those are enzymes just like the enzymes in our digestive system the enzymes get released and these enzymes break down the large molecules so if you can see here the enzymes look in this diagram like little Pac-Men and that's because they are breaking down the large molecule. You can think of enzymes like kind of like pairs of scissors where if you have a long mol a long molecule, a large molecule, the enzyme can then sort of cut it down into smaller pieces to allow um, it to be easily absorbed. So now we have the small molecules absorbed by the composer. Okay, so these microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, the protoctus, whichever organism is doing the decomposing, they then use the digestive molecules for the life processes themselves. So basically any sort of, anything that we regularly use nutrients for, because they basically just digested the nutrients. Um, so growth. or energy. Same thing as we use any sort of food for. So decomposers break down anything that is dead or decaying. We have large molecules and what they do is they send out enzymes outside of itself, have it get broken down, and then the now small molecules then get absorbed. So it's quite a simple process. The reason why it works is because since the large molecules are coming from like a dead organism or decaying organisms, it's not going to go anywhere, right? It's not like it has to hunt and chase it down to get it to stop moving. It's there, all it needs is to get broken down a little bit and then it can be absorbed. So. Decomposers are quite important. If you imagine a world without decomposers, right? Anytime there is um, 
roadkill on the street. You know, someone accidentally hits something by the side of the road, hits a deer. Imagine if that body, that body of that deer never broke down. Imagine if when we died, our body was just there, never rotted, never decomposed. Everything was exactly the same. You'd go out in the street and there'd be just bodies of roadkill of anything, anything that is dead everywhere. It'd be a horrible place, horrible place. The only reason why we don't see that is because of the fact that bodies decompose and that's all to do with these decomposers. We call this process that they involve themselves in the carbon cycle because we need to make sure, right, since we are taking in food, we're eating food, um, that when we die, all of those nutrients are not just locked into our body and instead they get recycled. So, if somebody passes away, we have, you know, the protein in our hair, uh, sugars in our body, protein and fats um, that make up our entire body. There's a lot of nutrients that make up our entire body that would go to waste if it doesn't feed back into the environment, feed back into the system. So the carbon cycle is what we call um, the recycling of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats what we call organic compounds. So compounds that make up living things. So it's how we're able to recycle this. Um, if someone gets cremated, they're, the nutrients that are in their bodies, um, they wouldn't get recycled. So there is like a push where some, like some organizations, some companies offer, like if you pass away, they offer you to be buried in like with a seed from a tree. So then you can, your body then can feed a tree, Thing, things like that, that people are sort of thinking about now. So then all of the nutrients that make up our body can get recycled and put back into the environment and then go on to feed other organisms. So I do have this diagram here, though it might be a bit confusing at first glance. So I want to just start off with one particular part of this carbon cycle, because this is a diagram of the carbon cycle. I want to start off with carbon dioxide in the air. So carbon dioxide is not yet an organic compound. It's just a gas, but plants or algae turn the carbon dioxide into an organic compound using the process known as photosynthesis. So say a tree takes in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, turns that carbon dioxide into sugars, glucose. Now the plant can either break down the glucose in respiration, so break it down for energy and release carbon dioxide back again, which is this loop, or an animal can eat the plant. And now that glucose, that carbon, that carbon passes on to the animal. And once again, that animal can break down some of that sugar, that carbon, and release it back into the air as carbon dioxide when it break, breaks it down, or it can process it a bit and poop it out even. So we have carbon compounds in animals, can poop it out, or when, it, when it's dead, it bodies, the body decays, and over time it can also form oil and natural gas. Remember when we talked about fossil fuels, we talked about how those were the remains of living creatures from a long time ago. So that over time 
can be burned then by power station and release the carbon dioxide back into the air. So the main idea behind the carbon cycle is where does the carbon go? We can actually trace it. So it starts off in the air, plants can take it from the air, and then put it back in the air through respiration or feed animals, which then can die and turn into oil and natural gas or put it back in the air through respiration again. But the main problem that people discuss is the fact that instead of carbon being locked into coal and oil, um, we instead burn it and then place a bit more carbon dioxide in the air than what is normal, which is then affecting the, the t global temperatures. So that's the main issue that we're discussing. And one of the f fixes is obviously planting more trees, because the more plants there are, the more carbon dioxide is taken from the air then. So we finished with this topic. I'm just going to give you a quick recap for what you need to do. The main things that were covered this topic is what type of organisms are there? Why, we, why do we have small organisms in the first place? We call these small organisms microorganisms. And there are three main types that we talked about. We talked about fungi, we talked about um, bacteria, and we also talked about protoctis. Now you need to know the difference between fungi, bacteria, and protoctis in terms of how they reproduce and what type of foods they make as well in terms of its respiration processes. So for example with fungi if it respirates aerobically, so with oxygen. We often use it to bake bread because the bread rises. If we don't have oxygen, we cut off the oxygen supply, we can make alcohol with that. With bacteria, we don't really use aerobic respiration, but we use anaerobic respiration to make our yogurts and our cheeses. And we call that process the fermentation of milk. So when we have milk, we put some bacteria in it that are safe to consume, and it breaks down any sugars that are available into lactic acid to make yogurts or cheese. And we also talked about Protoctus and three main types of Protoctus. And the three main types is Paramecium, Amoeba, and Algae. All three have different w ways in which they move. All three have different ways in which they attain nutrients, specifically Algae. They use photosynthesis instead of needing to eat or other organisms. And we also talked about how all of this relates to the ecosystem as a whole. So we have the different roles that we play in our ecosystem. We have producers, we have consumers, which include herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, and we can show the different, um, the ways in which nutrient is passed on through our ecosystem through diagrams such as food chains or pyramid by numbers to show populations. And we also talked about the importance of decomposers in that all the organic material, all of the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins that organisms have in their bodies, if they pass away, can get broken down by microorganisms then and released back into the environment and put back into sorry, my mic cut off then, and put back into other organisms. So hopefully now we are a bit more confident with our quiz that is on Show My Homework. It is multiple choice to make it as easy for you guys um, to do as possible rather than have you guys needing you guys like typing it out and whatnot. There are um, multiple attempts that you can do on the quiz. So if you're not happy with your first score, feel free to do it again, even if you have already done it. Okay? Right, good luck and have a good rest of the day. So do that quiz on Show My Homework now. 
I recommend just so then it's out the way though it's not due today it's due on the 4th of May but it'll be out of the way then if you do it as quickly as possible. Alright, see ya!